So that's a really what I think is a like I strange holiday <laughs> and it's my great pleasure to have our colleague from Canada here uh, Dr. Paul Andrews. Paul has a, a more interesting and more and almost as checkered academic uh, background as I do. I always tell people I'm not a successful scientist, I'm a family musician. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Andrews has started his uh, education and has a degree in aerospace engineering and then he went to law school and has a law degree and then he went on to get a PhD in evolutionary biology. So that's a really what I think is a, I, I, we've had a lot of conversations since he arrived yesterday. He's clearly a Renaissance man, I really doubt about that. And he has a very unique approach to his research and uh, is, is happy to, and I'm sure will be breaking paradigms throughout his career. So I think we're extremely fortunate to have him here. And with that, Paul. It's really quite a pleasure to be here. Um, actually, I got this gig from my parents, uh, surprisingly, who uh, are friends with Marie. And uh, of course, parents do what parents do. They racked up their son, and somehow this it all ended up in this, this gig, which uh, is great. Uh, but uh, to also see, uh, you know, I had no idea that in getting this gig, I'd be able to see some, some great colleagues, uh, you know, uh, evolutionary colleagues that I've uh, known about. So I'm really honored to have uh, people come from all over to, for this talk. I appreciate it. Um, OK, so the, uh, the title of my talk is Depressive Disorder or Depression by Design, Integrating Evidence from Molecules to the Mind to Understand the Evolution of Depression. So uh, <coughs> the symptoms of depression are characterized by sad mood, anhedonia, which is a loss of the ability to feel pleasure in normally pleasurable things like <coughs> sex, social activity, um, difficulty concentrating, uh, there are changes in weight, sleep, uh, and acti physical activity patterns, uh, fatigue, feelings of worthless worthlessness or guilt, um, and in extreme cases, you know, suicidal ideation and behavior. Um, there's also increasing uh, recognition of the importance of rumination, uh, which refers to intrusive, persistent, distraction-resistant thoughts that are related to the problems that are associated with the episode. Uh, depression is considered a disorder when it causes clinically significant distress or impairment, and the episode lasts for two weeks or longer. Uh, then it's called an episode of major depression. And uh, currently, the, since the, I guess the late 1990s, uh, antidepressant medications have been the, the first line of uh, treatment for uh, depression. Uh, the clinical state, or the, the, the diagnostic state, major depression, uh, is pretty darn common. Uh, if you look at just uh, interview people once uh, in a community surveys, you may get like uh, a 6% uh, um, rate of prevalence over the past year. But if you interview them multiple times over their uh, lives, uh, the rates uh, for the lifetime prevalence of depression, climb up to about fit, up to 50% in some cases. It's pretty impressively large. Um, we don't know a lot about depressive symptoms in small-scale societies, but they, uh, they're they there wherever we find them, or wherever we, we look hard. Um, so here are just a few uh, places that, I'm not an anthropologist, but I was able to find a few places that would see documents. Okay, almost all episodes are uh, caused or are thought to be caused by stressors of various natures. Uh, one of the most common stressors for, uh, that seems to cause depression is marital or romantic relationship conflict. But of course, you know, you know, bereavement, uh, job loss or financial difficulties, trauma, physical in, uh, health in problems, uh, etc. Um, nevertheless, sometimes people will tell you that their depressive episode happened out of the blue. These are called uh, endogenous episodes. Uh, but it turns out that uh, when you uh, actually look more closely at these so-called endogenous episodes, many of these uh, instances are 
uh, actually occur uh, or, have, or actually do have a, a stressor associated with them. It's just that the stressor is uh, often of a very sensitive nature. Uh, in one study, uh, the, sorry, uh, in one study it had to do with um, struggles with sexual identity. These are things that you just don't tell people on the first sort of date, so to speak. <clears throat> Now, if you've been, you know, following the big the news, uh, I guess outlets, um, depression has been in a lot in the news lately, and uh, and there are essentially um, two debates that are happening in the that have reached the, the, in the in the academic domain that have reached the public domain, and um, they have to do with essentially. Uh, Criticisms uh, of the current diagnostic, the current diagnostic and treatment um, guidelines. So, under uh, one sort of research thrust, uh, the argument is: Sorry, I'm getting a hand, I'm still trying to get a handle on this uh, <laughs> pointer and everything here. Um, so, under one research thrust, uh, the argument is: Is the current diagnostic criteria uh, for major depression? tend to over-pathologize what's happening with depression, and that many of these episodes that qualify as criteria for major depression may better reflect evolved adaptation than a disorder. These are some of the people uh, that are under, uh, uh, sort of have done work in this, uh, including myself. And uh, as you can imagine, there are a number of defenders of the current diagnostic criteria as well. And then the other research thrust uh, is basically uh, has to do with the treatment of depression. And uh, here, the, the claim by several people, including myself, is that antidepressants are um, uh, ineffective and or unsafe. And as of course you can imagine, there are a number of defenders of the treatment guidelines as well. So, uh, you know, I, as I been a part of these debates. I've seen many people sort of take take stabs at my work, and so here, I mean, we're going to tell you a little bit about what some of the, the critics say here. Uh, here's uh, Richard Friedman in the New York Times, basically saying in response to uh, a paper that I wrote in 2007, claiming that depression could be adaptive. That uh, he said, even if depression is natural and evolved from an emotional state that might once have given us some advantage. That doesn't make it any more desirable than other maladies. Nature offers us cancer, infections, and heart disease, which we happily avoid and do our best to treat. Depression is no different. Here is uh, another um, critic. This is Jerry Coyne, who's an evolutionary biologist. And he no should know better, but he basically uh, said that uh, this, uh, in referring to a similar uh, paper that I've written, uh, said that my adaptationist hypothesis could be uh, taken as suggesting that depression should not be cured, but cultivated. Uh, and that's, of course, not what I was saying. <laughs> and here's uh, John Oldham, who is um, the current president of the American Psychiatric Association, uh, making uh, a comment not about my work, but about the uh, work of my colleague, Irving Kirsch, who is, uh, I'll tell you about his work on antidepressants later on, but basically, uh, Oldham says, the bottom line is that these medications often relieve the patient's suffering, and this is why doctors prescribe them. Now, I think that actually underlying each of these comments, while I might take issue with sometimes how they've said things, there is a very humane uh, concern here, and that is, is that uh, they're concerned about the, the, the suffering that depressed people uh, <coughs> experience. Um, but there is an implicit claim underlying these uh, uh, each of these statements too, and it's that somehow the current diagnostic and treatment practices are necessary to alleviate the suffering caused by depression. Uh, we have to call it a disorder, uh, and we have to treat it with antidepressant medication. And of course, that's that claim is ridiculous. That doesn't need that doesn't necessarily follow at all. And we'll talk about that in, in more detail. Um, but this this concern about suffering and the need to call this suffering state a disorder uh, in order to treat it is actually instantiated in the, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, 
because they actually say that depression is a disorder, and they actually call any psychiatric state a disorder when it causes clinically significant distress or impairment. And it's easy to actually show that this is wrong, or that this, this leads to, um, there's some flaws in this thinking. But one of the things that I want to point out is um, that alleviating suffering is not the only goal of therapy. Um, and you can easily to demonstrate this by thinking about all the painkillers that have been taken off the market, not because they were ineffective at alleviating pain, but because they actually have a lot of other adverse health effects. So um, the basic uh, idea here is that their doctors uh, and physicians have a stronger injunction on them than to alleviate suffering, and that is to do no harm by their, their treatments. So uh, in this talk, what I want to do is uh, make the general uh, claim that evolutionary theory is crucial to the science and practice of mental health, and not just useful or helpful, but it's, it's, in a, it's, it's needed. Uh, and uh, there will be uh, three sub-themes uh, in here. One is that pain and impairment uh, are often the functional output of evolved adaptations for responding to problems and stressors. And therefore, pain and impairment do play an important role in promoting health. Consequently, then, the evidence that a trait causes uh, pain or impairment uh, is not good evidence of disorder, contrary to <coughs> the way psychiatrists currently think. Secondly, treatments that disrupt evolved adaptations should, by definition, degrade biological functioning. And by degrading biological functioning, they can cause disorder. So we have to be careful about the treatments that we give to people, precisely because we need to know whether or not they're interfering with an evolved adaptation. And we're going to make this claim about antidepressants. Um, and then finally, I want to uh, argue that depression shows some evidence for adaptive design for uh, promoting what I just call uninterrupted analysis of complex problems. Uh, and so we're getting at the adaptive design for a particular hypothesis for depression. And we're going to look at uh, a bunch of different types of evidence, situational triggers, the symptoms of depression, neurobiological evidence, and behavioral evidence. OK. Uh, before I go into that, I want to make some uh, stress some important concepts. I, at various times in this talk, might use the word sadness, sad mood, depression, depressed affect, depressed mood, depressive symptoms. Uh, they are, I'm using them all interchangeably. Now, in principle, it could be the case that depression, major depression that uh, you know, the DSM uh, defines, it could be different from, say, transient sadness. That, in principle, could be true. Um, however, all the research on this point basically says that the clinical criteria are essentially arbitrary. That depression is better characterized as a con single continuum that varies in the intensity and the duration of symptoms. So that's why I'm using all of these terms interchangeably. In this definition, then, clinical depression and major depression are toward one end of the continuum. Okay. The second thing that I want to be very clear about uh, is by making the claim that most episodes that currently are diagnosed as depressive disorder may be better characterized uh, as reflecting the output of an evolved adaptation does not mean that I don't believe in depressive disorder. I do believe in depressive disorder. And the reason is, is that if our eyes and our hearts, which are clearly evolved adaptations, can malfunction, and we know that they do, why shouldn't, even if there is some evolved machinery for producing depression, why can't that malfunction? It undoubtedly does malfunction at some rate. So let's, I just want to make that clear. I don't want to get involved in debates about whether or not I'm saying all episodes are, are you know, adaptive. I'm, I'm not. But I think that the crucial issue here is, are the diagnostic criteria that we use, are they accurately distinguishing between true instances of disorder and um, adaptive responses to stress. OK, so let's get into the pain and impairment. Uh, 
Remember, these two concepts, or distress and impairment, I just call it pain here because I think pain's more general and uh, everything, but these two concepts play an important role in how psychiatry views disorder. Um, let's, to show that pain plays an important role in health, it's consider, the, consider what happens to people who actually lack the ability to feel pain genital insensitivity to pain. It's an extremely rare heritable disorder. Uh, and uh, most people with this disorder uh, end up dying at a very early age. In one study, half by the uh, age of 30. Why are they dying? Well, it's because uh, as infants, since they don't feel pain, they will use their tongues as chew toys. Um, they are uh, susceptible to injuries because they don't know when they're feeling pain. If they, uh, and, and so they can get uh, also susceptible to burns and the infections that result from uh, the injuries. If they break uh, one of their bones, say in their leg, which is this child did, uh, they don't know to stay, keep their weight off of it, and so their legs uh, end up, their joints and their, their fractures don't heal properly. Uh, if you get, if they get something stuck in their eye, you know, if that happens to you and you know to flush it out, it's sort of painful, they don't do that, so they get irreversible corneal damage. You get the idea, right? Okay, um, so uh, no, I don't wish anybody to feel pain. I just don't recommend disabling pain mechanisms because it's clear they do something that is useful. In this case, you know, in pain helps provide feedback from the environment that uh, motivates us, it draws our attention to potential problems, uh, injuries, and helps motivate us to uh, take corrective action that uh, mitigates those, uh, that, those injuries. Let's also consider now the impairment part of uh, the DSM's criteria for a disorder. And let's look at it in a situation where you won't really disagree with me much. Think about what happens when you get sick with an infection. You actually have a lot of impairment that happens when you're, uh, when you're sick. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of the symptoms that you get uh, when you're sick uh, map closely onto the symptoms that you get when you're depressed, which is another reason why I'm using sickness to hate you. So uh, nothing is pleasurable anymore. Uh, you have decreased reproductive functioning. You tend to eat less. You tend to specifically eat less protein. Why is that? Because uh, there's iron in protein, and pathogens love iron. Uh, they replicate faster in the presence of iron. Um, the, you get fatigue social withdrawal, you sleep more, uh, you have difficulty concentrating, and of course you get an increase in your core body temperature, otherwise known as fever. Lots of impairment happening here, nobody's going to disagree with that. And your impairments can actually, depending on your infection, can maybe just last a couple of days, but sometimes infections last for a few weeks, sometimes they last for months, sometimes serious infections can last for years. Okay, so why do these impairments happen when you're sick? Well, they happen because the immune response requires massive amounts of energy. Uh, you have to uh, you know, activate and mobilize your white blood cells. Here's an activated macrophage. An activated macrophage uses, uses about as much energy as maximally functioning a heart muscle. So a lot of energy there. And of course, you have to produce antibodies. And there's a lot of proliferation that goes on there. That all requires energy as well. OK, so you've got all of this energy that you need to devote to your immune response. But your body has a limited amount of energy available to it. And uh, if you're engaging in all the normal everyday activities that you would normally do, um, that will draw energy away from your immune response. So what does your body do? Well. It upregulates the amount of energy devoted to the immune system, and it downregulates uh, all of these other um, uh, body systems, reproduction, cognition, physical activity, and social activity, so that you give your body the best chance of fighting off the infection. Everybody with me so far? OK. So what we have here is that the impairments in sickness behavior reflect a trade-off in the allocation of a limited resource, energy. And, uh, and so that's, now I just pointed out that depression and sickness behavior have this 
symptomological uh, overlap. Uh, they also have a neurological uh, overlap. So those again the, the symptoms. There are a few differences, however. Whereas you know, people who are sick don't generally think well at all. I did mention that depressed people have difficulty concentrating, but I also said that they had rumination. And and what's really happening here is is that the rumination on the problems that are associated with your episode makes it difficult to concentrate on other things, like your work or your social obligations. Okay, so there's a ruminative difference here, and then there's also a sleeping uh, difference here. Um, the depressed, or sorry, sick people sleep more. Usually depressed people sleep less, although sometimes they sleep more, but uh, there's also this REM difference. Uh, there's less REM sleep in sickness behavior and more uh, REM sleep than um, in depression. And of course, REM sleep is really important in, um, what is it, um, solidifying what you've learned with respect to complex cognition. So both the rumination and the, the REM sleep suggest that there might be, um, well, let's, let's let me take a step back. We've got some symptomatic, symptomological and neurological overlap between two uh, two states, or sickness behavior and depression. <coughs> this suggests, from an evolutionary perspective, that probably one of these evolved first, probably sickness behavior, because it's, you know, fighting off pathogens has been a really evolutionarily ancient problem. And that somewhere along the line, it got tweaked, and it got co-opted and tweaked, probably by natural selection, and the tweaking is evidenced by the, the few symptomological differences that exist. Okay, and these, the fact that these both relate to cognition suggests that there's maybe a cognitive function uh, at stake here. Okay, um, and we've talked a little bit already about uh, uh, the trade-off that I'm about ready to suggest. So. If we can make sense of the impairments in sickness behavior as an adaptive trade-off in the allocation of a limited resource energy, maybe we can make sense of, maybe that suggests that uh, the impairments that occur in depression could potentially be uh, the result of an analogous trade-off. And we do know that attention is a limited resource. So as these pictures demonstrate that you can do stupid things when you're uh, concentrating too hard on one thing and uh, thereby screw up on other things. Um, and we've talked about how uh, rumination is resistant to distraction and persistent, and in some sense reflects an, uh, uh, a, an allocation of attention to the problems associated with uh, the episode. So uh, put another way, if you're busy ruminating about uh, your uh, failing romantic relationship or marriage, uh, you're going to uh, not be so good at other cognitive activity. But you might also expect that uh, reproductive activity, physical activity, and social activity require attentional resources as well. And if the idea here is, is that we need to allocate attentional resources to problem associated with the episode, then it might make sense to downregulate just about everything, uh, these other, uh, <coughs> all these other systems in the body. But we'll go into that in a little more detail as we go. Okay, so at this part of the talk, I just basically uh, want to say that uh, pain and impairment in depression is not conclusive evidence of disorder. Um, I haven't really substantiated the claim that it's evidence of adaptation yet either, but I'm just making a plausibility argument at this point. And then we've also seen the first indication that perhaps rumination in depression might potentially do something useful. Just raising the, the, the possibility at this point. Okay, part two. Disrupting evolved adaptations degrades biological functioning. <coughs> okay. Uh, so most common treatments for depression simply suppress the symptoms. Uh, I think that's pretty self-evident with antidepressant medications. Uh, there's a form of talking therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy that is a complex therapy. Uh, it has multiple components to it. One component of 
CBT involves trying to change the way depressed people think about their situation. And in that sense, it's a disruptive or a suppressive uh, kind of therapy, that component of it. Uh, but then there's also um, people commonly uh, use uh, other ways to suppress their symptoms like drugs or alcohol or sometimes distraction or thoughts of issue. Okay. Um, now, before we actually talk about what's happening with antidepressants uh, and other forms of suppressing depression, let's think about what happens if we simply try to suppress the impairing symptoms of sickness behavior. Okay, we've got all these impairing symptoms, lethargy, sleeping, sexual withdrawal, inability to concentrate, blah, blah, blah. And we say, we're going to treat these symptoms the same way we treat the symptoms of depression, which is to suppress them or disrupt them. So the treatments here would involve, well, OK, so you know, you're too lethargic, so we're going to start giving you, you know, you're sick, OK, this is the patient. I'm the physician, you're the patient. You come into me, you're sick. You're, I'm just going to tell you, you're too lethargic. We're going to start ramping up your physical exercise here. Uh, you're sleeping way too much. You need to be on a strict eight-hour sleeping schedule. No afternoon naps. Uh, you're withdrawing from your uh, social environment. And, well, that we're going to increase your social interaction. You're having difficulty concentrating. We're going to give you attention-focusing drugs. Uh, you're uh, eating too less, particularly protein. Well, we need to give you that iron-rich protein now. Uh, sexual difficulties, Viagra, fever, we'll give you anti-fever medication. Well, what's going to happen here is, frankly, you could potentially kill people doing this, right? Uh, depending on how seriously the infection was. Um, and, uh, and more technically, what's happening here is, is that <coughs> normally, what you are devoting much of, most of your energetic resources to fighting off the infection, that's what these imp impairments symptoms reflect is the devotion of much of your energy to the fighting off the infection. And what you're doing with these interventions is forcing the body to spend less on fighting off the infection and devote more to these other activities. That's why you can potentially kill people with this. Uh, you couldn't get this passed through an ethics review board, right? Um, and uh, okay, but then you're probably thinking, wait a minute, don't we interrupt these symptoms, at least one of these symptoms, all the time? like fever. Isn't that a common, uh, commonly done in hospitals? And, uh, every, well, so let's actually take a closer look at that. What happens, what about fever? So first of all, I want to point out that fever is an evolutionarily ancient trait. Uh, all of the evidence suggests that it's an adaptation. Uh, but it exists in um, all the major vertebrate groups and even some invertebrates. So what is it that uh, anti-fever medications due to people with infections. Well, we know from the few experiments that have been done that they actually prolong the infection. Uh, we've got it for evidence of malaria, chickenpox, flu, common cold. Uh, basically, uh, it takes longer, in this study of malaria, it took longer for uh, the, the patients who were given uh, paracetamol, which I believe is the British term for Tylenol, uh, uh, to clear out the malaria. Also, they increase viral shedding. So uh, for viruses like common cold or influenza, um, the, this reflects uh, you know, the way in which um, viruses are transmitted is through the, the viruses that are shed and released through the nasal effluent. And um, when I told this to my colleague at McMaster, David Byrne, that you say influenza, treatment of influenza with uh, fever caused by influenza with anti-fever medication, he said, well, this is definitely, if it's increasing viral shedding, it's increasing the transmis transmission of uh, the influenza. And since influenza is one of the major causes of infectious, of death due to infectious disease throughout the world, he said that it's a no-brainer. The, uh, these drugs are causing people to die as a result of this. Um, he just said it's a matter of how many people are dying. And we're currently collaborating on a mathematical model to try and uh, estimate exactly how, how many are, are dying as a result of this. 
And for very serious infections, they can directly kill you too. Here's the only decent uh, study that I know of that um, looked at, it was a randomized controlled experiment. Uh, basically uh, had um, 44 patients who were randomized to, uh, uh, this is in a hospital, this was I think uh, on an ER or, uh, or an ICU unit. Um, and uh, once they, they were randomized, once they had a fever, they were randomized to either the Tylenol or no Tylenol groups. Uh, seven out of the 44 who were um, put in the Tylenol group uh, died. Only one in the no Tylenol group died. That was out of 38. Uh, the significance was not quite significant. It was marginally significant. But the reason for this is that they had stopped, they, they actually analyzed the data midway through the study. And that's when they saw this uh, marginally significant effect. They reported this to their ethics review board because they had applied to their ethics review board to have a waiver of informed consent. So the ethics review board shut them down as the result of this. Okay. So now I hope to try and say to you that, uh, that actually the disruption of an evolved adaptation can have some very severe negative consequences. Ones that we don't necessarily think about, okay. Now, back to antidepressant drugs. Well, psychotropic drugs were, have been hailed as the, a great advance in the treatment of psychiatric disorders. It allowed physicians to treat many more patients uh, than they otherwise were able to with talking therapies. Uh, but are they really helping us? Well, uh, you know, Good science gives us control over the phenomena that we study. And it allows us to do some powerful things. Not always good things, but powerful things. Uh, for example, uh, you know, since the, oops, I didn't count this wrong again. Since the uh, early 1900s, our understanding of uh, the causes of infectious disease has improved dramatically and has allowed us to develop interventions that have uh, allowed us to reduce the rate of death due to infectious disease by about tenfold uh, over that time period. That's powerful stuff. By this metric, though, what's, what's, what can we say about uh, has happened in our science of depression? Well, in the 60s and 70s, depression and before, depression was basically considered rare and had a good prognosis. Uh, one in a thousand were deemed to have had clinical depression. The natural remission rate of those uh, one in a thousand was about 50% within the first few months. Only one in 4,300 needed hospitalization. Um, and of those who were hospitalized, 50% had no recurrence in 10 years. Only 10% uh, had chronic level depression. Well, if you know anything about depression, you'll say, wow, that's striking because now depression is considered the common cold of psychiatric disorders. And it's considered a progressive disease. I told you earlier that uh, within the past year, the, the estimates are about six point, you know, six or seven percent of people will have had an episode of major depression within the last year. And over the lifetime, the estimates are getting, you know, close to fifty percent. That is probably conservative too. Um, and also, depression is now viewed. Uh, I said it's progressive disease. Uh, and it's thought that if you get depressed once, it changes your brain, and it makes you more susceptible to future episodes. And that's the so-called kindling hypothesis. So what's changed between the 60s and the 70s uh, and now? And of course, there has been some diagnostic uh, changes in how the, the DSM defines uh, depressive disorder. However, that diagnostic change doesn't really well explain the worsening in prognosis. The other thing that's happened is that there's been a widespread increase in the use of antidepressant medications. They're now the first line treatment for depression. So I want to raise the possibility that antidepressant drugs are somehow making things worse. It's a, it's a hypothesis. We should be able to entertain it just like any other. Okay, well, um, nearly all antidepressant medications that are currently um, widely used on the market target serotonin and norepinephrine, which are neurotransmitters in the brain. And there's good experimental evidence in rats and mice that serotonin and norepinephrine do regulate depressive symptoms. It 
it's hard to do get that same level of experimental evidence in human beings, but uh, it's really strong in rodents. And the most common mechanism by which antidepressants work is uh, through what we call reuptake blockade. So basically, if you can imagine, this is the end of uh, serotonergic neurons. This is where serotonin is released into the synaptic cleft. So this is maybe in your hippocampus or your prefrontal cortex is where these neurons might be located. And the serotonin is released into the synaptic cleft, and uh, it does, serotonin will act on the postsynaptic neuron and cause firing and whatever else is happening to the, that neuron. But uh, eventually, this serotonin needs to be cleared out of the synapse. And it's cleared out by something called the reuptake transporter here. It's taken back into the presynaptic neuron. And what most antidepressant medications do is they bind to and block the serotonin transporter, preventing the uptake of serotonin back into the neuron, which tends to keep ser uh, serotonin levels in the synapse to be pretty high. And so when you take an antidepressant medication, synaptic levels uh, of serotonin increase within minutes to hours of administration. Uh, now, serotonin and norepinephrine are normally under homeostatic control in the brain. Um, uh, I don't know, do most of you know the term homeostasis? Okay. I will go over it just a little bit just to uh, make sure we're all on the same page. But uh, your body's core, core body temperature is under homeostatic control, too, which means it's kept at about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, meaning if you exercise and get a little warm, your body pushes back against that or causes you to sweat and exerts a pressure or whatever, and essentially puts your body back down, brings it back down to 98.6. And if you're too cold, you'll start shivering and everything, and it'll essentially bring your temperature back. So a homeostatic mechanism just tends to keep up some parameter at some equilibrium level. And homeostatic mechanisms have to have a sensor component that uh, tells when there's a deviation from the equilibrium. There's a feedback component that press or push to sort of exerts feedback to bring it back to the equilibrium whenever there's a deviation. And some homeostatic mechanisms have uh, a mechanism for setting the equilibrium. And that's, of course, exemplified in the case of body temperature by the example of fever, where you've got an infection, your body temperature goes up higher, and then that's your new equilibrium that uh, your body regulates things around. OK, so um, serotonin and norepinephrine are normally under homeostatic control. The most, the, the most common uh, disorder hypothesis for depression is, is that serotonin and norepinephrine are dysregulated in depression, uh, which somehow implies uh, that there must be, if it, is a disre if, it, if it is a disorder, if there's something is being dysregulated, that it's a breakdown in the homeostatic mechanism uh, regulating serotonin in some way. Um, now, again, in the normally functioning brain, then, what an antidepressant does is, uh, let's imagine it's your first day of antidepressant use. It will cause your uh, serotonin levels in uh, your frontal areas to increase within minutes to hours. And now imagine that you have to you keep taking the medication day after day, and we've assessed your, uh, the, how much it increased things over time, and what you find is, that it would decrease over time. That the amount at which serotonin increases due to the drug is less and less over time. And it eventually comes back down to your pre-medication baseline. What's happening? Well, your brain, the homeostatic brain, says, this is where your serotonin level should be. You're taking a drug that's pushing it up here, and I don't like that. It should be back down at the homeostatic equilibrium. So it exerts a pressure that pushes things back down to the equilibrium. How is that pressure uh, exerted? Well, it turns out there's a decline in, it does this by decreasing the, ser the synthesis of serotonin, which will tend to keep bring it back, uh, since there's less of uh, it synthesized, there's less that can be produced or put into the synapse, and uh, that's how it eventually uh, brings uh, things back to baseline. The interesting thing, though, is, is while these drugs are attempting to increase uh, serotonergic levels, uh, your overall forebrain content has to decrease as a result of this, and that's exactly what happens. Okay, well, this is what happens in a normally functioning brain. What happens in 
the depressed patient's brain. Well, we don't know this. It's really hard to actually measure what's happening uh, to serotonin in a human being because um, it requires invasive techniques. But uh, you would expect, though, that if the depressed patient is has normally functioning homeostatic mechanisms, contrary to the current hypothesis, that you would see evidence that the brain would be pushing back and that depressive symptoms might return. And of course, most of you, if any of you know, that that's exactly what happens. Uh, we have two pieces of evidence that I'll just mention briefly. Uh, I mentioned my colleague Irving Kirsch earlier on. Uh, he's basically shown uh, in uh, an important meta-analysis that when you compare the uh, overall effect of antidepressants relative to placebo, that antidepressants have very, very limited efficacy which is exactly what you'd expect if the brain is pushing back. Um, and uh, even those uh, who are, respond well to antidepressants, the symptoms commonly return. And it seems to be a function of the time that you're on antidepressants for. Within six months of continuous use uh, in one study, it was 35% re returned, uh, had a full relapse. Jumped up to 46 in that same study for 12 months. And in another study, it was 68% within two years. And uh, another common thing that'd be sort of, as a result of this kind of thing, <coughs> it's common for patients to come back to their physicians and say, I'm, uh, you know, not, uh, I'm feeling worse, and they'll up the dosage or change the drug. This is all evidence of the brain pushing back against the effects of these drugs. What happens, though, when you discontinue the drug Okay, this is, you've built up all this pressure in your brain that fights against the effect of this drug. What happens now if you stop taking the drug? Well, think about a homeostatic mechanism like a spring. It's a classic example. Here's a spring in its equilibrium position, and now you pull the spring away from it, okay, to a certain degree. Uh, what I'm basically gonna argue is that pulling the spring is like taking an antidepressant drug. Then, when you stop taking the drug after six months or two years or whatever it is, uh, that's like releasing the spring. What happens to the spring? Does it just simply go back to the equilibrium position? No. What does it do? It overshoots, right? It overshoots. And the degree to which it overshoots relates to how far you had pulled it in the first place, right? Okay, well, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because all of these antidepressant drugs differ in the degree to which they perturb serotonin and norepinephrine. That's, that's like saying they pull the spring to different degrees. Okay. So uh, we might find then that the prediction here is that stronger drugs should cause a greater risk of relapse when you stop taking them. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Well, here's just uh, a bunch of these different drugs, um, and here's how much they perturb serotonin and norepinephrine in an area of the rodent brain that has been implicated in depression. We have placebo as a comparison down here. Uh, placebo does not affect serotonin or norepinephrine, so it's given the value of 100. So these represent the percent increase, or in some cases decreases, uh, how much of, of the degree to which serotonin or norepinephrine is being perturbed. Um, and here's what uh, the risk of relapse related to the, the, the degree to which they perturb serotonin and norepinephrine. This is in a meta-analysis that I published last year. So every point on here reflects a study in which uh, an a particular antidepressant was being used for a period of time and then discontinued. And then they followed those patients after discontinuation for their risk of relapse. Okay, so that's what the y-axis refers to, and say that drug, say, was Prozac. Well, we knew from the rodent literature how much Prozac perturbed serotonin in an area of the rodent brain, and so that's what the x-axis represents. So what we found is, is that how much it perturbs things in the rodent brain affects the risk of relapse upon discontinuation in human studies. And that didn't need to happen if the rodent brain was not a good model of what's happening in 
human brain, but as you can see, we got significant results in those babies here. Okay, implications. If you can get better without uh, antidepressants, uh, you have a much lower risk of relapse. Okay, that's a fair uh, implication of this work. Uh, also, because, and I'll just go back here and point out that, again, here's where placebo is, and it's where the lowest risk of relapse is. <clears throat> So antidepressants are increasing the risk of susceptibility to depression after discontinuation. This can leave people stuck in a cycle of, well, they, they take antidepressants to um, affect their mood, uh, and they temporarily feel better, but then they get, once they get better, they try and go off the drug. That puts them in an increased risk of relapse, and then they think, oh my gosh, I need to go back on the drug to prevent uh, this recurrence of depression. <coughs> this may possibly explain the poor prognosis okay, that we talked about earlier. Okay, the other thing I want to mention briefly about antidepressants is that serotonin, it refers to the fact that serotonin, we're, we talked about you know, serotonin in the brain, but actually most of the serotonin that's produced in your body is in the gut, and then it transports throughout the rest of the body and has effects lots of different um, uh, uh, systems in the body. Because we talked about uh, it affects attention and mood, of course. It also affects normal death and growth, sexual behavior, sperm morphology, development, gastrointestinal function, uh, platelet activation and clotting process, as well as electrolyte balance. And all of these things uh, are regulated in some part by the serotonin reuptake transporter, which is a member that the, the common uh, mechanism, or the most common mechanism by which these antidepressants act. So antidepressants, in principle, could have negative effects on all of the, these systems, and in fact, uh, they do. Um, I've just published a review that uh, shows that, uh, that antidepressants have negative effects on every major system regulated by serotonin. Uh, and it appears to be so strong that overall, antidepressants increase the risk of death in the elderly. Here are three or two studies. There's a third one which doesn't have a, the same metric there. But there are three studies now that have been published, epidemiological surveys that look at the risk of death in elderly people uh, associated with antidepressant use. Now, the interesting thing is that depression itself is associated with an increased risk of death. What these numbers reflect here are the increased risk of death associated with antidepressant use over and above what is caused by depression. And this is like five, this, in this study, it's five deaths out of 1,000 uh, people over a year, and it goes up to about 44. As a comparison, Vioxx, a painkiller, was taken off the market in the face of evidence of about 7.2 cardiac events in 1,000 uh, person years. So uh, we're talking numbers that are at least as, as uh, the same order of magnitude, if not much higher. And in fact, Cardiac events don't need to be fatal, so you could argue that even this number is a more serious number than that number. Okay, um, so we've got evidence now that, uh, so, so these are all the different ways of disrupting depressive symptoms. You can sort of use distraction, you can use that cognitive change component of CBT, alcohol or drugs, antidepressants. Okay, it turns out these will all make you feel better in the short run. While you're taking a, you know, having your drink, it makes you feel better. And while you're avoiding things, it makes you feel better. But the, and same thing with antidepressants. But the longer term effects are negative. Uh, as you can easily think about with alcohol and drugs, uh, it makes episodes worse in the long run. And that's essentially what we've just shown here also with antidepressants. Uh, and there's evidence for this with respect to avoidance, as well as uh, the cognitive change component of CBT. What about, um, instead of disrupting the symptoms of depression, what about encouraging them? There's a, a therapy that's been developed for depression uh, that's essentially journal writing. It has people write their strongest thoughts and feelings associated with their episode. And um, it does make people feel worse while they're doing it, okay? But uh, in the long run, it actually shortens episodes. And the people who do this, uh, are uh, uh, rated to have higher insight into the problems that are associated with their episode. And uh, so basically the outcome here looks pretty good. 
okay, so antidepressant medications appear to be suboptimal as treatments for depression. There's a limited symptom reducing effect, many adverse health effects, and there's an increased mortality risk. Um, all methods for disrupting depressive symptoms appear to interfere with rumination, and that's associated with longer episodes. Promoting rumination is associated with so shorter episodes. Another piece of evidence that depressive rumination might be useful. So let's go into uh, this. Let's address this issue directly. Okay, two key facts about depressive rumination. First is it's difficult to interrupt. Again, it's intrusive, persistent, resistant to distraction, difficult to, uh, to suppress. There is a large body of evidence that shows that depressed mood also promotes an analytical processing style. What do I mean by that? I, the anal analysis is a divide and conquer processing strategy. It's where you take a complex problem, break it into smaller components. Those components are more manageable, makes the problem easier to solve. But you have to solve, you have to do the study each component one at a time. And you have to keep track of these components then too. Think about how you might do a math problem in your head and you understand exactly what has to be done. So because you have to keep track of the components, uh, analysis is vulnerable to interruption and so it has to be uninterrupted to be successful. So, um, this led me to suspect, well, geez, if depression is difficult, depressive rumination is difficult to interrupt, and analysis, which is promoted by depression, um, has to be uninterrupted to be successful, maybe this distraction-resistant feature of depression is not, does not reflect pathology, as is commonly thought, but it's actually a design feature to, to help promote uninterrupted analysis. And that led to this following hypothesis that we uh, published in Psychological Review, uh, that um, depression is an evolved response to complex social problems that require analysis if they're to be solved. And its function is to coordinate multiple body symptoms systems to promote uninterrupted analysis of those problems. This proposes the following etiology for depression. Okay, we know that bereavement, divorce, illness, you know, interpersonal conflict can cause depression, but it's been a problem to understand why is it, what's so common about these different kinds of stressors that causes depression, and why is it that sometimes bereavement causes depression, but other times it doesn't? Here, this hypothesis suggests that they'll cause depression if they pose a complex problem that requires analysis. depression, and then uh, it does, promotes all these changes in the body uh, that are designed to promote uninterrupted analysis, uh, which takes place during rumination. And then the implicit the implication is that this will help solve the problem and then by, hopefully result in uh, the end of the depressive episode. So there are several crucial issues under this hypothesis. First is, do analytically difficult problems trigger depression? Okay. Well, the answer to this is we don't know yet uh, fully. Um, it's hard to know, you know. But let's let's address let's address this in a sort of stepwise fashion. One thing that people always ask me when I talk about this is, well, geez, what about bereavement? A loved one dies. What's there to analyze in that? You know, you can't go back and you can't change the fact that died, right? Um, and, uh, well, it turns out that, sorry, bereavement and divorce are more depressogenic if they lead to financial difficulties for women, and for men if they lead to difficulties managing the household. There's, this is replicable, you know, research here. So, there's, you know, it's, we often think about the reason why bereavement and divorce uh, is causing depression is because of the loss of an attachment figure, and that undoubtedly plays a role. But there seems to be a practical component here, too. And if you think about financial difficulties and difficulties managing the household, well, both of these things actually do pose complex problems. You know, financial difficulty really means you've got fewer resources that are uh, available uh, than uh, drains on your resources. And you have to sort of figure out how best to allocate these limited resources to the, 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 your obligations. And the same thing with respect to household 
management stuff. So what I would suggest is that these, this kind of evidence is supportive of the idea that analytically difficult problems can trigger depression. Uh, but obviously, I can't go and do experimental research on people where I put them through a divorce condition or a financial ruin condition. So I tried to do something that I could do experimentally because I wanted experimental control. And I decided, well, why don't I just take an analytically difficult task? Um, something like the Riemann's Advanced Progressive Matrices task. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this task, but uh, basically it's a spatial reasoning task. And you have um, elements in the questions that change in a both a horizontal and a vertical direction. And you can see that there's essentially two elements in this one that are changing in the horizontal and the vertical direction. So uh, you have to choose which of these best completes the pattern here, and what's the answer? guys are smart guys. Uh, just one, two, three, four, five, six, five. seven, eight. Which one? Five. 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 That's right. Good job. <laughs> you get whatever you give me off. Um, okay, excellent. So, uh, but this is an analytical task because you have to sort of look at each element sequentially. Right? Okay. So you get it. And in the, this particular test, the rate of the advanced progressive matrices, they get more and more difficult as you go along, and they vary. Uh, the number of elements goes up to five, okay? And you can imagine that it gets hard to keep track of everything. So the experimental design I did was I, this is this AMQSD. My students decided to call this the Andrews Mood Questionnaire. <laughs> so uh, it's a questionnaire that I developed and had validated, but uh, basically uh, have a before measure of mood. And then I gave them five practice uh, questions from the Ravens, and they vary in their difficulty. Some students got a uh, control condition, which was simple, simple, simple. Then others got an easy set of five questions. Others got a moderately difficult, and the others got a very difficult set of practice questions. But they knew they were practice questions, so that they knew that they were going to have to do a, sh a version of the test later on. And so before that test, but after the practice questions, I looked at their mood state there. So this is trying to get people to, to get a new some mood state here and keep it there because they knew they were going to have to um, uh, do the test. And uh, so then the prediction is, is that as the more difficult the question, if these practice questions are, the greater the level of depressed mood. Okay. And the Andrews Mood Questionnaire has like four different emotion scales. This is the sadness, how they responded on the sadness scale. So this is the change in sadness. And you can see that there's essentially a nice graded effect as you go along here. I, it may not look super high, but I've just tried to keep everything on the same scale. So sadness is increasing in a graded fashion. Here's anxiety. Here you don't have the nice graded effect anymore. Um, here's calmness, which is sort of the opposite of anxiety. And that you don't have a uh, graded effect either. And uh, here's happiness. And uh, so there's a loss of happiness, but it's not in a nice graded fashion. So this is the only one that shows the nice graded effect. Now, of course, one possibility is, is that people are um, uh, getting depressed because the practice questions are difficult and they're giving up, right? That's one possible explanation for this. Well, it turns out that. I don't have a, um, at, for this experiment, uh, I don't have a definitive answer to that. Uh, but I wasn't trying to rule that out at this point. But I will say that we had something like two or 300, you know, about 200 participants, maybe 250. And for the first five, the first 100, I inadvertently gave people um, Remember, these were practice questions, which meant that in order for them to be practiced, they, I gave them, I told them what the correct answers were so that they could understand where they went wrong. And it turns out for the first 100 participants on the difficult uh, set of practice questions, I gave them incorrect feedback. <laughs> I, I got the answers wrong myself. <laughs> but I figured that out. <laughs> and then for the next 100, I gave participants uh, correct feedback. Okay. So um, <laughs> what happened with the, 
what's what happened here? Well, <laughs> okay, so here is the blue bars reflect the correct feedback. That was the second hundred. And the first hundred, uh, this is the incorrect feedback. But of course, it was only this condition that had the, uh, the actual incorrect feedback. These were still good, but I keep them there and separate out so I can, you can see that nothing's changing here, nothing significantly changing here, nothing significantly changing here, but here's a big significant difference. Meaning, I would think that if I gave you if I gave you a hard, hard practice question, you put down the correct answer was one. The correct answer is actually eight, but I told you that the correct answer was six, you'd be really confused. Right? You'd really give up. If that were the but okay, so I think that makes a lot of sense. But these people aren't becoming more depressed, they're becoming less depressed. It's the ones who got the correct feedback. They're like, wait a minute, okay, this is tough stuff, but I'm beginning to understand it, or at least I have the hope of understanding it, okay, by continuing on and, and working through. All right, crucial issue two. Do the symptoms of depression show design for promoting uninterrupted analysis? Well, okay, this is, I'm gonna try and go through some of this uh, a little more quickly, but uh, basically I think that the idea is, is that uh, Anhedonia, which is the loss of interest and in, loss of ability to feel pleasure in sex and food and everything, makes a lot of sense if you're trying to stay focused on, um, you know, figuring out what's going on in your failing romantic relationship. Sex is a distraction from that. Food is a distraction from that. And so, uh, and in fact, anhedonia is has been associated, associated with neurobiological studies as a focused attentional state, which is exactly what you. Uh, you can think of sleeping as a big distraction from, uh, from uninterrupted analysis. Uh, and in fact, people who ruminate more do sleep less, as you predict. Um, now, uh, social withdrawal is it's commonly said that depressed people just withdraw socially. And that's, um, that's, uh, that would be consistent with the idea that social interaction is essentially a distraction that could interrupt your but I also just want to point out that sometimes they do interact, and sometimes they seek treatment, and that's a form of social interaction, right? Um, in fact, what they want to seem to do in those situations, they want to talk to people that can help them with their problems. This is kind of like bringing in another brain to help you with your uninterrupted analysis. Okay, okay now we know uh, from what's needed to promote uninterrupted analysis that it requires activity in an region of the brain called the left ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. It's left lateralized, okay? And, okay, so this is involved in promoting uninterrupted analysis, and it turns out this exact same area is lit up in patients who have been diagnosed with major depression, so providing further support that um, people have uh, symptomatic design for uh, promoting uninterrupted analysis. Okay, but what's actually happening here in this is that in order to promote uninterrupted analysis, neurons in this area have to fire in a sustained fashion, okay, uh, throughout any period of potential distraction. And uh, this can be very stressful for neurons. It's like you can sprint for a short period of time, that's no problem, but you have to run a marathon, that's pretty darn stressful, okay. So this is like neurons having to run marathons. And, uh, I want to go a little bit into the neurobiology of this here, but basically the idea is, is that, uh, okay, here's this area of the, the brain. Most of these neurons in the cortex are glutamatergic. They release a, a neurotransmitter called glutamate, which is highly excitatory. And, um, and so again, this is, this is, imagine this is a neuron that's firing in a sustained fashion. So there's two problems that, that uh, cause stress to the neurons here. One is, is that neurons themselves do not have a source of energy. Uh, they, don't have, they don't store glucose in, their, in them, okay? So under normal firing conditions, the way uh, neurons get uh, their glucose is to pass a diffusion of glucose from nearby arterioles. But this is kind of a slow refueling process, and it's too slow for sustained <coughs> firing. 
The other thing is, is that glutamate, while it's excitatory, is also toxic when it's at high levels in the synapse, which means that neurons can die as a result of high synaptic levels of glutamate. So if these neurons are having to fire continuously and sustainably, you can imagine there's going to be an accumulation of toxic glutamate in the neuron, in the synapse. How do these problems get solved? Well, they are solved by a form of cell that's extremely common in the brain called an astrocyte. Astrocytes are the only source of stored glucose, or glycogen, in the brain. Um, and what happens is, is that uh, under the sustained firing conditions, they uh, break down that glycogen and convert it into lactate, uh, which is then preferentially used by these neurons. And this is a rapid uh, uh, process, so it's, a, it's, it's something that can sustain the, uh, the firing of these neurons. Okay. Then the other thing that astrocytes do is they uh, clear out the uh, glutamate from the synapse, convert it to a less toxic form, and uh, send it back to the neuron where it gets uh, reconverted back to glutamate and recycled. Okay. The final thing that astrocytes do is because there's less of a reliance on um, uh, glucose from the blood, these astrocytes constrict the blood flow. Okay. And so we have a really interesting situation right now, which I'm going to bring up again in a second. We have sustained firing of these neurons, but we have less blood flow to the region because there's more of a reliance on uh, astrocytic glucose to sustain neuronal firing. So what you have is a decoupling of neuronal firing from blood flow. Remember that. The next thing um, is that it's all of these processes, the clearance of glutamate from the synapse, the, the breakdown of glycogen into lactate, and the constriction of these arterioles, it's all regulated by serotonin. And it requires high levels of serotonin to do this. And if you understand the whole basic hypothesis about serotonin and depression, you understand that it's, it's thought that depression is a state of low serotonin not high serotonin. But again, nobody's been able to study this in patients, you know, in human beings because uh, it's, it requires invasive techniques. So it's all circumstantial evidence, and this led me to suspect that that hypothesis is wrong. That serotonin is involved in regulating depressive symptoms, but they've got the direction of association wrong. Okay, so is serotonin an up or a downer? I think it's probably a downer. When we've actually been able to could put rodents through uh, depressogenic stressors, and you can measure serotonin in their poor brain areas through these invasive techniques. That shows that serotonin is increased in the poor brain area. We also know that genetic variants that are associated with higher levels of serotonin are associated with an increased risk of depression, and this is true even in human beings. But people haven't alighted onto this yet, and it surprises me. Um, and then finally, uh, um, they, there's been a recent study uh, looking at the main metabolite of serotonin coming out of the brain through the jugular vein, and they found that uh, this metabolite level was elevated, and these people said this was inconsistent with the low serotonin hypothesis. Again, that's in patients who have been diagnosed with major depression. Okay, so remember, I wanted to point out that you get a decoupling between um, neuronal activity and local blood flow to the area, and this is all being driven by high levels of serotonin, and um, so what we might find is some puzzling neurobiological findings in depression, patients with depression. Normally, you find uh, people with, and so here's, here are these findings. This is a, a study by Dunn et al. 2005. This is the core, these are maps of the correlation between uh, neuronal activity and um, uh, blood flow. And the green reflects positive correlations, which is the normal, what you normally see in most of your uh, studies, the positive correlation between uh, neural activity and blood flow. But in depression, you have these negative correlations. 
So I'm taking this as indirect evidence, further indirect evidence that serotonin is elevated in depression. Can you explain that graph a little bit more? I mean, how, do, how, do you, how do you measure that? In other words, you're scanning them for blood flow. You're doing PET scans, left lateral, frontal, uh, lights up for they activity, but, but decreases for blood flow in the range. Yeah, you, you have to, okay, so you have to use two different types of PET in order to do this, and I can't remember the two different types, but one, I think, is looking at oxygen, and the other one is uh, or the oxyglucose or something like that. Um, so you have to measure, same depressed patient, you, you do two different types of PET, um, and uh, you, uh, and so then you, once you get the measure, you have, say, I don't know, eight to 10 different subjects, what you then do is, is correlate the plot, I guess, the, uh, their fluoro, the, the, the blood flow PET score versus their neuronal activity score. So and this is the difference there. It's not, you know, you, you plot it as a, as a you get a, 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 an actual correlation, okay? okay? You get that for, if you do it for all 10 patients, right, you've got, you know, a plot that you can get a correlation on. And so that's what these are reflecting. It's either a positive correlation or it's a negative correlation. Okay, okay. that's what I mean by that. Okay. Is that helpful? Okay. All right, uh, I know I need to finish here soon. I apologize. Um, why do depressed, okay, here's the crucial issue three. Um, you bring depressed people into the lab, okay? They actually perform, often they perform worse than non-depressed controls on many kinds, but not all kinds of tasks, cognitive. Now this seems like a puzzle at first glance because if depression is promoting an, uh, analysis, analysis is an incredibly useful uh, processing strategy for um, solving cognitive problems. Uh, but they're performing worse, how do you square the circle? Well, it turns out that it's, well, the whole hypothesis that it's promoting uninterrupted analysis of the problem that triggered the episode helps explain this. Meaning, if you're focusing so hard <coughs> on the, the issues relating to your failing romantic relationship, you actually are not going to be able to, to think very clearly or carefully about these abstract cognitive uh, tasks that researchers uh, are, are giving you. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that the reason why depressed people perform worse on cognitive tasks is that they aren't thinking about other things. It's not a permanent deficit, it is an attentional deficit because or it's a def, a def, an attentional effect. They're attending to something else. And you can reverse the impairments by just having an intervention, like think about a black umbrella for five minutes. That's enough of an intentional intervention to make depressed people perform just as well on these cognitive tasks as the non-depressed. Finally, then the real issue is, is not how depressed people perform on abstract analytical tasks, it's how they perform on the problem that triggered their episode, the, you know, the romantic relationship. And this is something that I am very interested in doing. I don't have a lot of evidence on this, but remember that uh, Raven's task I showed you about earlier? Well, you know, I had a similar, I did a published a study back in 2007 that had a very sim essentially an identical design. Uh, and, uh, but I only had difficult practice questions here. And I looked essentially at, the, at their uh, depressive response to uh, these practice questions and correlated that with their performance on the Ravens and I got a nice positive correlation. Okay. Um, so I hope to replicate this and do some more. And obviously there's lots of, this only is it's experimental, it's with what you would all call subclinical uh, depressed mood, uh, but it's something that I can do as a first start experiment. Okay, so the conclusions of my talk, you know, physicians have an ethical responsibility not to harm patients. Um, and uh, we've got uh, pain and impairment are often adaptive responses to stress. Um, we need an accurate understanding of the cause of depression to make appropriate treatment decisions. If, in, if we can truly identify instances of disorder, then it might be very helpful to reduce those symptoms. 
But in instances where it's an adaptive stress response, we may be uh, doing more harm than good by uh, suppressing the symptoms. Current diagnostic criteria do not accurately distinguish between disorder and adaptive stress response. Um, and uh, let's see, we've got quite the evidence for this is uh, that uh, pain and impairment from the blood criteria. Uh, we have some evidence that depression shows signs of adaptation for promoting uninterrupted analysis, including some interesting neurobiological evidence. And we have uh, some evidence that interventions that, okay, we basically show that antidepressants cause harm. And my argument here is, is that interventions that cause harm are more likely to be uh, uh, disrupting of evolved adaptive mechanisms. Okay, um, I, you know, I know there's lots of other things that people want to talk about when I give these talks. They want to know about suicidal behavior. They want to understand the genetic variability of depression. Um, Sometimes they want to know about uh, depression in other animals, uh, and uh, I've got some other things I can talk about. I just wanted to at least make a comment that I'm aware that there are many other questions that people have, and we can talk about them. Uh, and these are my acknowledgments. Uh, so I'm just going to stop here and uh, thank you for your time and your attention. Everybody is. <laughs> it is massively compelling. <laughs> this is a little off the wall, but I remember when I was a graduate student reading a paper saying that depression was adaptive because it made people more creative. Right. I don't know if you remember that paper. I mean, what would you say about that? Um, you know, uh, it's, it's something I've looked at a little bit, um, but uh, it's not something I feel well versed in. As you can imagine, there's thousands and thousands of studies on depression and different perspectives. What I will say is, what I remember is, is that the most recent test of that didn't find any evidence uh, that, it, that, uh, that, say, people, when they were depressed, were more creative. And certainly, um, I don't also mean to say that all problems are solved with analysis, right? It's problems that have a certain structure are solved better with analysis, problems that can be decomposed. Um, and, uh, and not all problems have that structure. And so there is a, this uh, uh, literature on how different mood states promote different kinds of problem solving, right? And uh, it's thought that creative uh, uh, problems are often promoted more by positive mood states. Uh, and so I don't mean to be saying that that negative moods are the only kind of moods that help you solve problems. You're creative with solving social problems, maybe. So maybe the other thing is, is, I think that, um, I just want to mention this, I think that some problems that people experience uh, may require both creative and analytical components. So many problems don't have just a single structure to them. Uh, a good example of this might be, uh, if anybody's done computer programming, you've got a long computer script. I mean, technically, you know, you could solve, you could debug it with an analytical processing stuff, but it cl quickly overwhelms your working memory. And you need to sort of take a step back and think about the overall big picture. What am I doing at this part? What am I doing here? What am I doing here? And that requires, um, you know, a different kind of thinking than analysis. Uh, so anyway, uh, actually, this gentleman had a, his hand up. Well, I was, I was thinking now I switched questions to your okay. topic, but I, I mean, you could think of that a little bit in the. Mentioned the 60s and 70s, the, the uh, prescribed therapy was limited by a different set of criteria. I mean, depression is obviously on a spectrum, but uh, you know, at that time, it was thought less uh, situational depression would, would be less of a would be less of an indication. Absolutely, yeah. You could also argue that situational depression might be more amenable to creating an adaptive uh, versus the idiopathic. But I, I, the one kind of comment on your correlations, it would be by, uh, if you were using the animal models and so on, the amount of serotonin uh, augmentation or, or whatever with the various classes of drugs. My impression would be that, that many uh, prescribed 
prescribing physician, psychiatrist, whichever maybe you know, that is, would kind of work their way up that ladder, uh, you know, the MAO inhibitors for the severe depression, resistance, and everything else, right. which would probably be more um, likely to have recurrent behavior and, and so forth. So I don't know if, if there would be a way to control for a degree of depression. Okay, I will say in those studies, Often they, there. I had, um, okay. I had no evidence that physicians, that the patients say who were, were involved in the studies involving the MAOIs, had actually been through the process that you described. Meaning these were, um, they weren't selectively targeting patients who had been resistant to prior medications, um, and in, in many cases they had similar numbers of depression histories, uh, and, um, uh, yeah, I mean. It'd be nice to have a major for that, because like but, MAOs but, would potentially yeah. uh, very serious side effects. I mean, people oh, tend yeah. to avoid those of us almost. And sure, yeah. It would be, but I can't think of a way to control for that. You know, the other thing I, I meant, wanted to sort of mention, I've had some people be critical of that study, um, and one of the things that I did was I, I had these discontinuation states where people had been on antidepressants and then stopped. Okay. The other thing that I had is how did I get those placebo studies? What are those? Okay. Well, those were studies where they had a different design. They put people on either antidepressant or placebo at the beginning. Then they followed, then they looked at everybody who got better, remitted, and then they kept everybody on the same treatment. So now I was able to look, pull out that one arm of those studies where people had been on placebo at first, and then they followed those who got better, their risk of relapse. And some people have criticized me for, for using those studies because these are, they're basically making a similar kind of argument there, but in the other direction, that um, people who get better on placebo are a special breed, and it's not fair to include them in my analysis. But remember, I put up these nice regression graphs essentially showing correlations. And I can, uh, if their hypothesis is right, if I excluded those studies, I'd actually expect to see the regression estimates to change substantially. And they were spot on, suggesting that whatever problems there, I mean, almost any problem you can imagine for, for why I've uh, included these studies would suggest that the estimates should change once I excluded them. They were spot on. So um, I think that was pretty strong evidence that uh, that, that I was up the, the right tree there. Um, did, you, I think that somebody back there did, and I can't remember. So it's really very interesting. Um, I'm more along the interventions spectrum. Okay. And so I'm just looking at this and saying what the implications are for that. Sure. But looking at it from a population more than a didn't get more depressed. Right. <laughs> I mean, so it's kind of a really interesting, I yeah. don't know how you, um, how you go after things that are more broader so, you know, social environment kinds of factors as opposed to individual. Like you and the Mark. So also, I agree, very compelling and very interesting. And I think your critics think that you encompass everything with depression. And I'm glad to hear Severe recurrent debilitating people with depression from. Well, actually, I didn't do that. You said at the beginning that you understand that there is such a disorder. I didn't say. I didn't say what it was. I think what I really mean, though, is is that, and I, this is why I brought up the duration of the sickness sometimes can last a really long time. But you wouldn't say that their immune system or their whole body response is malfunctioning there. 
I don't even think the duration criteria, you know, uh, a duration criteria is a good way of um, um, uh, highlighting what's a depressive disorder. Uh, I mean, what do you, what's that, that's got to be necessarily arbitrary too. Is it two weeks? Is it two months? Is it two years? I don't know. I mean, you know, in speaking with Kim Hill, he's given, who is an anthropologist who studies the Aceh down in Paraguay, he told me some stories of people who had uh, been uh, near the top of the social hierarchy uh, and had made bids to become the top, and they uh, lost those bids, and in the process of losing those bids, they became essentially, um, uh, they went to the, the bottom of the, the hierarchy and were uh, almost ostracized from their group. And that's a very, very serious problem for uh, people in uh, hunter-gatherer groups. And they were depressed for over a year, okay? This is the kind of duration that many physicians is gonna say, this is chronic, this is disorder, right? But this is so severe a problem for these people. And it's who, who is it for us to say that that is too long of a period of time? And he said that, the only, that, that they only resolved their depression when they made up their mind to leave their, their group. And, um, and that is not something you engage in lightly, right? Um, and because uh, there's huge risks associated with that. And I mean, I'm not saying that they were thinking it through, but they might very well have been thinking. So anyway, the, the, I, I, I'm willing to say that people who have really, really long episodes are more likely to be having a true instance of disorder. But who knows, you know. But the other type of disorder you could have is a de depressive disorder where you fail to get depressed, right? So we got to think about those, too. Anyway, I'm sorry, you wanted to follow up. I wanted to follow up. Cancer patients. I, I study cancer patients. And those that have depression fare worse in terms of their illness. So what, what do you do in a situation like that? Do you recommend letting them work through what they're working with? And if the depression is situationally related to the cancer, and of course they can't control the cancer, they can't make decisions regarding the cancer, but they can make decisions regarding surround, things surrounding the cancer. Do you work through them or do you let them work through them without treatment? Do you try to treat them because you know the depression is going to hurt the progression of the disease? It's a good question. Um, okay, uh, first of all, I'm not so familiar with this area, but um, I do know that it's generally hard to find unmedicated patients nowadays. So the question I would have back to you is, is you know, our, this, this finding that we have between uh, cancer and, a, and uh, being worse with patients are also depressed, is that completely, do we know that's true for unmedicated patients? Uh, or do we, is the medication itself, you know, kind of causing the problem as well? You mean uh, the cancer medication? The, the antidepressant oh, medication, antidepressant. sorry. Yeah. Um, and I mean, my suspicion is we don't know the answer to that because we don't even know the answer to many of the questions about depression, basic questions about depression. I'll think more about it, and, and, but, but Mark it has been um, good to wait, and I don't want to give him a chance to speak. Um, I'll try and be brief, because yeah, there's a million great questions I think we probably all have. I'm really struck by the parallels with psychosocial stress and glucocorticoid response. So I've had a long-standing argument with Rob Sapolsky, who at one point argued that it would be beneficial to uh, prescribe anti glucocorticoid drugs for psychosocial stress. And it struck me as being uh, you know, flat in the face of why is it that we elevate cortisol in response to stressful events? And his argument was well, you know, it's an adaptation for physical response, escape for predator, it's a mistake in a novel environment. But my goodness, you know, and look at the complex machinery that's involved with linking psychosocial stimuli with glucocorticoid response. It makes no sense at all. It's a mistake. Right. Um, but so anyway, and, and then all the, the kinds of uh, correlations that suggest there's adaptive design there are just analogous, parallel. And it's not just in the glucocorticoid system. I would say arguably we can look at analgesics and the differences between, say, Tylenol and nonspecific anti-inflammatories and how Significant the effect. It's the same story of, yeah, these are systems designed by natural selection. Um, 
the, get to my question. Okay. Um, you know, this is great. We've, we've got repeated examples of there being issues when we muck about with systems that are designed to accomplish certain tasks. Aspirin, fever, you know, classic. We're doing the same thing here with depression, the same thing with psychosocial stress. Um, I think we get into a little trouble if we have maybe a different goal. And you sort of pointed that out initially between what, what is the physician, the clinician trying to do? And I think there are going to be some instances in which we might be committing what we would call the naturalistic fallacy of let the adaptive design work itself out. The cancer example I think is a great one. Um, but I mean, there are going to be two circumstances in which we, we might want to reconsider allowing the, the, the evolved design to do its thing. One of which we've all thought about, which is novelty. So we've got a bizarre new environment here, and we're exposing ourselves to new kinds of conditions that can cause the adaptive design to go awry. Um, the other circumstance that is not often thought about is that maybe being cognizant of the evolved design, we might be able to have different kinds of decisions. I don't know if this example will help, but um, maybe. So let's say there's an evolved design for sexual jealousy in our psychology. I think we could all make big money if we could come up with a pill to damp down sexual jealousy. Because seriously, I mean, in a modern environment, is it really you know, doing something that we all want to have happen? I mean, you know, one can argue, yeah, it makes sense that you want to make guard and that you should have evolved systems for doing that. But wouldn't the world be a better place? <laughs> you're, you're getting into a crazy world. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe we want to go too far with it, but, you know, there, there might be some areas in which I think we could be a little more sophisticated in how we let these systems go or not. So, yeah. um, you know, I wonder if there is not room for that in depression. There could be. I mean, you know, the other thing is we can create, I mean, sort of get it this slightly different way, is people will often tell me, okay, maybe you've made a case that it's adapted, it's been adapted in our evolutionary past, but there are aspects of modern life which make it, you know, not helpful anymore. That modern life is too hectic and, uh, and it's just too costly. You can't, you can't afford to take off from work or your social obligations or whatever in order to do this. And you know, I don't have, these are sort of like <coughs> questions that I don't know there's a good scientific answer to, uh, right? Um, but I would say we can design a society that does, that presumably makes depression completely maladaptive if we wanted to. Would that be a good thing? I don't know. I don't think necessarily in my mind. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have control over, to some degree, we, you know, human beings make the society that they have and they do influence the, how costly or beneficial some things are. I think that's kind of what you're getting at with the whole sexual jealousy thing because, um, you know, now you do some something that maybe makes some evolutionary sense, but can get you in big trouble with the law, right? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, then you've screwed up your whole life as a result of that. Well, no, you know, I, mean, I don't know. Or sink you into depression. Or well, sink you into depression, yeah. I, I don't want to have a society where I am not free to uh, occasionally uh, ruminate and uh, Person. So, uh, I I personally be against uh, having drugs around just for that reason. Um, yes. More and more, we see children diagnosed with depression, younger and younger and younger. Um, what are your views, both on the drugs, because they're all given drugs at an extremely early age while you're still growing and maturing? There's got to be long-term consequences. Yes. On the other hand, if you're going to let them mood about it for a year, it's incredibly not healthy to be in a mood mode from seven to eight years old. So 
what, what would you see as the trade-offs there? Well, I mean, I don't know. I think it's, we're sort of, again, creating a society where it's not okay for kids to be kids. So, and so we're trying to find drugs to, uh, to make them be not the way they are. So I'm not really uh, in favor of that. The other thing about the negative effects of these drugs is there, there of course, is interest in the developmental effects of these drugs That's for this reason. And um, there's a recent study that uh, shows that uh, it's, I guess, prenatal exposure is uh, associated with an increased risk of autism. Um, in, in mice and, and rats, they've uh, found that, <clears throat> remember we talked about homeostasis and everything, so you've got to imagine at some point in the organism's life, there's some setting of where serotonin levels should be in the brain, right? Somehow that has to get set. What's the equilibrium? And uh, so uh, I think that that potentially can be interfered with with these, these drugs. So what they found is, is that like uh, neonatal uh, rodents exposed to um, an antidepressant drug for just a couple of weeks or maybe even seven days, uh, and then and then not exposed to them again, okay, influences their behavior as adults. Now, as adults, they have a depressogenic behavioral profile, okay. Uh, so you know the idea may be is, and since these drugs do pass the placental barrier and they pass through uh, the mother's milk, you know, you got to wonder what are the effects, uh, are, we gonna, are we setting up our kids to have to be on antidepressants for the rest of their life because we're influencing the overall internal neurochemistry. I mean, there's so many things we don't even know the answer to. I told you, you know, the death rates there, um, those are the estimated death rates for over a year in, in elderly people, okay. And they're about, in one study it's 50 and older, in the other study it's 65 and older. Um, but what we don't know is, of course, some people are taking these drugs, uh, starting taking those, these drugs in their young adulthood, and then they're taking them for decades or the rest of their life. And are we cutting off years of their life as a result of that? I mean, we don't know the answer to that. Uh, and frankly, one of the things that we could have done early on with all of these drugs is we could have done stud studies in rodents looking at the mortality effects of these drugs. You put rodents on these drugs for all their lives and see how long they live for. Okay, now they last, what, a year or two, so it does take a little bit of time, but uh, you know, we could have done that decades ago and had the answer to this question uh, much, you know, at least preclinical answers to this question a long time ago, but nobody does these studies. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, close colleague Ed Hagen, right? He's done a lot on this stuff. Um, you know, some of uh, the some of the other work that I've done uh, maps closely onto uh, Ed's basic uh, perspective on postpartum depression. But depression may have a couple of different functions, and I want to actually emphasize that a little bit too. Depression. You know, we've got this idea that sickness behavior produces depressive-like symptoms, right? We could even, some people even call that a form of depression, okay? We've got maybe this social, analytical kind of potential function uh, for depression, too. Um, but in principle, you could get the symptoms of depression adaptively whenever you're dealing with some resource that's of a... Uh, a limited nature, and you have to make trade-offs in the allocation of this resource. I think you know Ed's Ed's idea is um, essentially that your social resources are limited too, and uh, and you get the symptoms of depression <clears throat> are useful in putting pressure on your close social partners to come help you, um, and it's just based on the idea that your other your close social partners have an interest in how well you're functioning. And, uh, so, so your close social partners want to help you, and so they take to the doctor to get that. <laughs> <laughs> Which may be a good thing because but what the did mothers they... rate children of depressed mothers are very different than children of non-depressed mothers. So you really don't want a depressed mother to, 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 to children of the mother. Yeah. 
I just wanted to sort of say that, yes, that's exactly what, but that's actually suggestive of the evidence that, that when the, in, the child is depressed that it, it, and that it, it's exerting pressure on the mother because the mother takes the kid in to get the drug. The, the mother doesn't want to deal with the problem that caused the, 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 the kid's depression. The mother is wanting the symptoms to stop because they're costly to her. And, and so what happened then in, in environments before we had drugs? People had to pay attention to uh, to what their social partners were, whether they were depressed or not, and then help them deal with those things. One thing you could look at is, is files, kind of files, because I don't think parents say bring your kids to the doctor. I think they say they don't think they want to go to the doctor. And so the parents will, and it'll be on the file, will say you try this, 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 and that. They're now worried about things like suicide or hurting. Oh, I was just being flippant there. I didn't but I mean think to that be. Made, yeah. I'm wondering, I, I understand the relation is good, and I know the literature on pen and paper and all that, but I wonder if the parents really want to be involved in this. In some cases, the relation just Okay, you're saying it's not adaptive. What's the evidence that it's not adaptive? Nobody has tested this stuff. You know, there are lots of beliefs and claims about depressive rumination out there. And uh, one is is that it's cyclical and it's unproductive, and you just get stuck. But nobody's active. You know, where is the empirical evidence for that? Now, I'm not saying that in principle you couldn't. Yeah, it could be. It could be. It could be. Um, and I'm not trying to dismiss that. But but we, but I, I've had many a person essentially make this this claim that uh, they they uh, many a therapist, a psychiatrist, or sometimes a clinical psychologist will say, you know, I just never see that it's adaptive. And yeah. But but the other part about this though is is that I don't know that individual clinicians are necessarily in the best position to be making definitive statements about the adaptive nature of somebody's rumination. Okay? I mean, is all we got... Adaptive when it is suicide? Is it adaptive? Is Let's adaptive? talk about suicide. Okay? Let's talk about suicide. Uh, Okay. Um, all right. So I, I I almost had this actual part of the talk, but I needed to cut something out, obviously, right? So. Uh, yes. That um, what you think about the processing power, uh, the EQ power? So the people who have more EQ. EQ emotional. Cogents. I'm not saying intelligence. Uh, <laughs> more like uh, this situation solving problem, but. I don't. You can't say I do too. I, I, I just about those people who have, who have more adult social problems. Yeah. Social skills to solve social problems. They get through this. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
hypothesize this is, is that, well, if, if depression is a response to analytically difficult problems, you might expect people with greater analytical reasoning ability to be less likely to get depressed. Um, because, uh, actually, the, uh, more formally, I actually did look at this a little bit in a, an earlier paper. I, I was able to make the argument, based on some empirical data that I had, that what depression seems to reflect is the degree to which you're focusing your cognitive resources on a problem. Okay? So people who are ruminating more or more depressed are focusing their cognitive resources more on a problem. So you can now imagine people with differing levels of intelligence have differing pools of cognitive resources available to them. And a given level of a given problem should be less take less resources for somebody who's more intelligent than somebody who's less intelligent. Right? If it's a given problem, you can control for the problem, then that's the kind of reasoning. And so then you'd expect intelligence to be a buffer to depression. Um, and in general, the research bears that out. We all hear stories about very smart people getting um, depressed, and they do get depressed. I'm not denying that. Um, but it's probably because they're in different environments that require more of their you know, intellectual capacity, et cetera. But basically, in general, there's a negative, mild negative correlation between intelligence well, and I depression. Know that people control their environment better as well, and so the whole issue of yeah. running into trouble doesn't happen as much because you have anticipated yeah. problems and you control yeah. it. Is it is it a technical problem that you're dealing with? I mean, your ability to deal with intelligence is doesn't overarch every kind of factor. So if you're dealing with a problem outside of your your skill set. Then I can see where it's going to yeah. Unless you assume that intelligence is more of a blanket thing. Yeah. So, all right, she asked me a question. Uh, so, can I, can I answer it? Sorry. It's, uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, okay. Um, right. I don't think, I've got some evidence that I tried to publish that intelligence actually does have complex effects on depression. Um, and it came from an adolescent sample. And so we had uh, a measure of different life events that these adolescents had experienced in the last year, their current level of depressive mood, and a measure of their uh, intelligence by the Ravens progressive matrices uh, test. And what we found is, is um, that adolescent boys who had experienced um, a, the initiation of a new romantic relationship within the last year Okay. That, in, that intelligence buffered the depressogenic effect of that. Okay. Now, the interesting thing that I found out after I found that finding is, is that, that romantic relationships are more depressogenic for, for boys than for girls. Uh, and and it seems to be it's related to the complexities of... And, you know, obviously, there's a euphoric state in, in the initial phase, but if you remember the question basically got an initiation within the last year. That's plenty of time to get over the euphoric state and to start having some com complex problems, right? Okay, so um, intelligence in that situation buffered the depressogenic effect of that. But we also asked the question uh, that uh, had they broken up within the last year too? And there we found the reverse effect, that um, intelligence exacerbated the depressogenic effect of breaking up within the last year for adolescent boys. Um, and you know, the way in which I tried to do some post hoc reasoning about this was uh, to, uh, first of all, to sort of give you this, that if, if, the, if at least for the first finding, it's that the um, these boys are kind of outgunned by their uh, female uh, girlfriends uh, in the early uh, ages. And so, uh, but a male who's got uh, a little more intelligence is better able to cope with it, and so that intelligence is a, a buffers the depressogenic effect. Um, but I also started reading David Geary's book uh, on male female, and uh, I started thinking about what else is happening. You know, what's an important part of male sociality, especially in the adolescent years? And it's um, uh, finding ways to build coalitions and to 
jockey for dominance, but without breaking apart cooperative bonds, right? And so under that view, when you actually break a cooperative bond, that's actually a failure in some sense. Uh, and then I started thinking, well, maybe intelligence is exacerbating uh, the depressogenic effects of a breakup because here it's, I've screwed up. And more intelligent boys have more to think through about it than, uh, than less intelligent boys. Speculation, postdoc reasoning, and uh, you didn't find this effect for girls. It was specifically boys. And uh, yes, sir. That's why I specifically mentioned EQ. IQ people usually try to solve the problem. Like they won't stop. They are used to solving the problem, and they won't stop until they solve it. EQ people wrap it up. Girls well, wrap up the problem yeah. much quicker than the boys do. I, I don't know if I am a big. I mean, I mean, I mean the big, generalization wise. Yeah, there's a different sort of personality trait one can talk about. Sort of perfectionism. Uh, uh, Correct. Right. But that leads to more into IQ than the EQ part. But basically, there's this guy named Schwartz at Swarthmore who uh, wrote a book called uh, The Paradox of Choice. And he argued uh, that the more choices we have as consumers actually leads to higher levels of negative affect. Right? Uh, so too many choices, you have to think too much about things. And, uh, and he said that you know, people who do well in that kind of environment are satisficers. Like, what is it I don't want? If I'm not going to try and figure out the absolute best, then the, the number of choices I have isn't so overwhelming. Um, and so you know, that's, yeah, that's true. But he also has published something since that book uh, showing that people who are more perfectionistic uh, and less on the satisfying, more on the optimizing end, so they were more depressed. This was a sample of college students. And uh, they were more depressed while in college. But they, when they uh, graduated, they got jobs with higher salaries. So, I mean, it's again, if we want to think about depression as just inherently a negative thing to have uh, without any positive benefit, you know, you can do that, I suppose. Uh, but if you think about it as a, a trade off, yeah, it makes you feel bad, but there are some compensating benefits. It helps you think through problems, and they, maybe some of these uh, actually have real world consequences, then, you know, I think that's a more subtle and sophisticated view about uh, depression. Um, so that's right. you have a lot to say. Do you want to give somebody else a chance? <laughs> no, I'm totally teasing you. I love that you uh, have lots to say. You go ahead. I have a question. There's this growing literature on the relationship between nutrition and depression, and I was wondering if you were talking about that. Yeah. And I think it probably supports your argument. Have you been looking at that, or are you aware of it? I've been thinking about it. Uh, I think there was a recent study that came, somebody within the last week or two. I don't know if anybody else had seen it, but um, yeah, the, uh, people who have uh, more junk food. junk food. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that may to some degree explain some of the rates, but it's also related to all the functioning. So I don't know if you. I have. So actually, this gets at another great interest of mine, which is. Uh, I've become a low carb guy, uh, and uh, based on this wonderful book by this guy named Gary Taubes, uh, who deserves a PhD uh, for having written this book. Um, basically, he argues that all of the problems of modern life you don't find them in people in hunter gatherer groups, right? You know, you don't see. First of all, you don't see. A, I mean, let's say real hunter gatherer groups are still. You know, they're not on the reservation, and they're not. They're eating traditional diets. Okay. My understanding from Taubes is, and Mark, please correct me if I'm wrong, but he says there's essentially no instance of heart disease. You might have some cancers due to infectious diseases, but you don't have um, a lot of cancers. The cancer rates are a lot lower. Of course you don't have diabetes. You don't have caries. Um, you don't have gout. Um, and that there are, uh, you know, that all of these things are part of modern life. And that he makes a compelling argument that it's due to refined carbohydrates. And then he goes and gives some mechanistic explanation for it. And it, um, uh, and it has to do with insulin. Okay, insulin is, is uniquely uh, increased as the result of uh, carbohydrate intake. And um, 
Okay, and I, I will, I will uh, since I have a trapped audience here, I'm going to just spend a minute or two on this. I think it's fascinating. Okay, so the, the reason why he says obesity happens is because, um, okay, when you eat a uh, high carbohydrate meal, you know, your insulin levels spike, that causes your lean muscle tissue to say, take up the glucose from your bloodstream, right? Okay. Now, if you're having constantly a high diet of carbohydrates, your lean muscle tissue says, I've had enough, thank you very much, and, uh, and it becomes resistant to the effects of insulin. What does insulin do then? It says, well, I've got to get this uh, out of the blood, and so it takes it to the liver and converts it into fat. Okay. Then, uh, now we can, uh, so this is how fat accumulates, and it's not from the intake of fat, because insulin is the responsible drug uh, or chemical, and, and, and insulin is needed to do this. Okay, so then the trick is, how do people become obese? Well, it's because they're eating high-carb diets all the time. So what this ends up meaning, though, is that their lean muscle tissue, it takes more and more in higher and higher levels of insulin to get uh, stuff to their lean muscle tissue. Um, and uh, eventually, what? how does this go again? Um, okay. Uh, oh, right, okay. So... Basically, then, your lean muscle tissue requires a lot, really astronomically high levels of insulin to get stuff to it, and that means that you can have you can have a lot of food in your you know, in your belly, you can have a lot of fat on your body, uh, but your lean muscle tissue can end up starving, and and that's why he says that obese people tend to eat more and not exercise. Their body is saying. I, you need more food because you don't. Your lean muscle tissue is not getting uh, its nutrition, etc. Okay. So what does this mean? Okay. You're, if you're in terms of mood, remember we can think about depression as happening in any instance where you've got uh, a limited resource, right? And there is an old and ancient hypothesis for depression, which can be interpreted in this way as the energy conservation hypothesis. And it, uh, and it basically proposes that something like a condition like starvation will produce uh, depressive symptoms. And it makes perfect sense under the whole framework that I've just given you guys. And you can think about diet now as being linked to mood in this way. Uh, that uh, I think if that's clear. That's, that's how I would do it. And I, I hope to write it up because uh, uh, I think it makes a nice mechanistic story. Yes, sir. Not well, but I did have uh, somebody uh, write to me uh, and uh, told me that uh, um, he he was an academic and he told me that he struggled with depression for many years and uh, he was he was resistant to drugs and the only thing that worked for him was ECT. Um, but he hated it because it kept, it, it, it reset his brain, essentially, is what he said. And um, the, uh, it's just like all the other, you know, interventions that we talked about here. They interfere with your ability to think then. And, and he said that he was not able to, I mean, he could be work, in the midst of working on a paper, struggle with his depression, go through it, uh, get an ECT thing, and then he'd have to he'd be lost on writing the paper. It was horrible for him, uh, even though he had a, a symptomatic relief. So he really didn't like ECT. That's all I've got to say about ECT. Um, I ask this because of, in terms of the serotonin levels, how they were going up and down. Yeah. That, that, that's not pharmacological uh, interference. That's why it's more of a sudden interference that shouldn't. Well, I'm, I'm assuming you shouldn't change the serotonin level so abruptly. Should yeah. who knows? I mean, I yeah. don't know. I don't. I, somebody should do that in rats. And I'm pretty sure they did. Yeah. Well, we've kept Paul going for two hours. I'm going to suggest that we give him a break, and anybody who's around, he'll be around the party for a while. Sure. <laughs> I, I, I know. I'm happy to hang around and chat. So, uh, uh, but whatever you guys want to do, I know. I think if anybody else, if anybody wants to leave, they should go. I'm, uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, does anybody want me to talk about suicide? 
Do you want me to talk about suicide? Sure. Okay. Um, so again, I'm an evolutionary biologist. Uh, I've, since I've been working on depression, I, you know, people always ask me, well, okay, your arguments are interesting, Dr. Andrews, but it cannot be adapted to kill oneself. And I started looking into the animal behavior literature, and you know, it's it is clear that uh, there. Selection has favored adapta adaptation for suicide in nature in certain instances. This is the Australian redback spider. And uh, this is uh, the female uh, allowing a male to copulate with her. And so she's lying on her back, and the male's uh, facing that way. And um, in the course of copulation, the male does this backflip, placing his abdomen right in the jaws of the female. And she then proceeds to devour him. This is behavioral evidence of some kind of selection for uh, suicide. But why does it occur? Well, it turns out that in the Australian uh, outback, uh, female webs are few and far between. So if a male is lucky to, enough to get to one female web, if he inseminates her, uh, he's unlikely to be able to be successful in finding another female web before he's predated upon or dies from some other reason. So. Um, OK, so that's part of the story. There's not much benefit to be gained by going elsewhere. But the second part is, is that the female, if she, if she devours the male, is, uh, well, uh, she, he inseminates more of the female's eggs, and the, the female is less likely to mate with another male that, that happens to come around. So here, the benefit is, is he gets to fertilize more eggs if he allows himself to be devoured. OK, so that's why. And now, of course, that I've explained it to you, you understand it, and it makes perfect sense, right? OK. In uh, many Campanotis species of ants, uh, there are uh, some that where the, uh, upon being attacked, the worker will uh, has these long glands that uh, traverse his body that are filled with a gluey-like substance. And he will, or she will, explode herself. And it gets all over the, uh, the ant. And attacking insect or whatever, and uh, immobilizes it. And uh, so it's self-sacrifice, uh, an exploding abdomen. Um, and, uh, and the reason why the ants have evolved to do this is because even though the worker is sacrificed, uh, the, the attacking creature is less likely to be able to attack the rest of the hive, right? So favors helps out the genetic relatives who are still surviving. And of course, that makes perfect sense once I explain that to you, too. Um, so uh, in humans, uh, I'm not going to be arguing that we've got copulatory backflips or exploding abdomens. <laughs> but uh, there are um, a couple of hypotheses about suicidal behavior that you would recognize uh, as, uh, and as being, uh, you'd be familiar with them. And they are implicitly evolutionary or adaptationist hypotheses. These are the so-called cry for help hypothesis. Okay, that somehow a, a, an act of suicidal suicidal act uh, is an indicator of the fact that you're in, in some sort of distress or need. And then the closely related but conceptually different blackmail hypothesis that you 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 make a suicide uh, attempt to put pressure on or punish or hurt somebody else. And uh, both of these require, if you put the evolutionary spin on them, you understand that they uh, require some management of risk. Obviously, if, you're, if you have these social goals in, in line, you can't make a suicide attempt that's so risky that you're not going to live, survive to reap the reward. But at the same time, um, you have to have enough of a risk associated with it that people take you seriously. right? So management of risk is implicit in both of these hypotheses. And these are ancient, you know, relatively speaking from a psychiatric perspective, ancient hypotheses. Um, and uh, OK, so um, okay, so then, oh yes. So I, uh, this, it's, it's an ancient hypothesis, but there hasn't been a lot of evidence real empirical evidence uh, examining these things. I decided to look for it in the um, Ad Health data set. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a large uh, in, uh, 
nationwide survey of uh, uh, adolescents in the United States. And um, basically, they have information there. These are all retrospective uh, interviews. So we have adolescents who survived suicide attempts. Nobody died, obviously, in this. Uh, um, and you had different levels of, of uh, severity. You had people who reported making a suicide attempt, and then you had a question relating, did your suicide attempt require medical intervention or not? Okay, so there's a measure of severity there. Um, I decided to look at it in the context of parent-offspring conflict, because these ancient hypotheses often propose that you know, you're doing this often in uh, to influence close social partners and parents and offspring are a natural <coughs> one to look at. Um, here's, I'll just go to the, the result. Um, so I looked at birth order effects in this because my, you know, because some of my evolutionary colleagues had identified birth order as an important uh, variable within the family. So you have either first uh, borns, oops, sorry, Firstborns, middleborns, or lastborns, um, and uh, I looked at adolescents as uh, whether or not they reported uh, this high, low dissatisfaction with their mother or high dissatisfaction with their mother. Um, I didn't look at the father because there are fewer adolescents with their fathers. Um, and here's the suicidal ideation pattern, or suicidal ideation uh, attempt whether or not they made an attempt, and whether or not they needed medical treatment. Uh, basically, no birth order effects if they reported low satisfaction with their mother. You basically expect birth order effects to be important with in fam family interactions. So uh, in this case, we'd be expecting them to only occur in situations where there is conflict with the mother. And that's exactly what we found here. Here we find uh, no significant birth order effects with respect to ideation, but we have an inverted U, or sorry, no, a U-shaped uh, curve here with respect to making an attempt, and an inverted U uh, for uh, medical treatment. What does this mean? Well, um, I actually have reasoned this out beforehand. It's not post hoc. But uh, the basic idea here is that um, middleborns are in a difficult position with, with respect to their parents. Um, if parents are going to invest in their offspring, one way is to do it on the basis of how valuable they are. And under that scenario, firstborns are more valuable because they're closer to reproductive age from an evolutionary perspective. Lastborns are also in an interesting position because they're needier. So if parents are going to invest on the basis of need, uh, first lastborns should also be in a favored position. But middleborns are in neither favored position. So the argument is going to be, with one of the arguments that I've I, I tested here, was is that uh, middleborns, in order to successfully uh, capture you know, parental investment, might need to make a riskier attempt than their first or lastborn uh, uh, siblings. And, uh, and that's consistent with the idea that they're more likely to report needing medical treatment. However, if they have to pay a higher price for a given level of parental investment. It might be less, less worth it to buy. So hence the less likely to make an attempt in the first place. Okay, This is evidence suggesting that adolescents are engaging in a cost-benefit analysis of their uh, suicidal behavior. And where is this uh, analysis, when is this analysis taking place? Well, it seems to be taking during ideation because there's no birth order effects happening uh, during ideation. So you can think about what seems to be happening is if you start having thoughts about suicide, one of the things that you're thinking about is, is it worth it for me or not? And uh, so bringing this all back to the analytical rumination hypothesis, if adolescents are engaging in a cost-benefit analysis, Maybe now we've got a link between depression and suicidal behavior. That, uh, that depression helps promote the cost-benefit analysis that is taking place in suicidal behavior. Uh, and it suggests then that interfering with depression could have interesting effects on suicidal behavior. It could possibly reduce suicidal behavior. 
but it also could reduce the quality of your analysis that takes place during ideation. So you could actually make an argument that uh, interfering with depression could promote suicidal behavior. And what do we know about antidepressants? Well, they're often said that they're useful for reducing suicidal behavior, but they, the FDA put a black box on these things back in 2005 because all the experimental evidence showed that they increased the risk of suicidal behavior. And you know, the alternative explanation that uh, they want to give you is that uh, you know, if you're really so severely depressed, you know, you're not able to actually lift up your arm to engage in the act to off yourself. I don't really buy that uh, argument. Um, I mean, if anybody has been depressed, you know, uh, you know that your people eat when they're depressed and they move around when they're depressed. And the idea that they don't eat and they don't move is just a myth. Uh, people survive quite well and do function. I mean, they, 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 they may function worse than, than the non-depressed state, but they still are able to move around and do stuff. Yes? Well, everything you presented shows that these kids did not really want to kill themselves. It was a manipulative behavior. And my question was real suicide. And yeah. Suicide gestures are quite common, but real suicide. And I didn't say it wasn't adaptive. My question to you was, I'm not okay. revolutionary in any way. Okay. Is it adaptive for some people to say depression? I mean, for some people, is it adaptive? Yes, okay, but I do want to point out here that this requires some real risk. Yes. Okay, so you're going to expect, even under this social instrumental hypothesis, that there's going to be some people who die as a result of this, because otherwise there's no power to influence. Okay. Yes, people misunderstand the real risks involved. Yeah, so good point. Okay, but the other thing is is that uh, apart from that, yes, there there is another uh, uh, class of suicide. So there are basically suicide researchers I identify two classes of suicidal behavior. One is the one really trying to kill yourself, and the other one is more like this type. And um, and that other this other type um, is more likely to occur in old age. So the the risk of really you know, tending to kill yourself is increases with old age. It also is higher for people who are chronically ill. Um, it used to be, I don't know if this still holds, but being a white male in your 30s living with your parents was also uh, a big risk factor for, for doing this. And, you know, I think the, I think you're probably already intuiting what's common amongst these things. These are people who have little success left in life to look forward to, right? So that hypothesis is more like along the lines of, um, let's see, like the whole, you know, what's happening here with the Campanotis uh, species. The, a lot of the older chronically ill are not depressed. It's a very that's rational, right. non-depressed behavior. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what they do. That's right. Yes. Um, I was talking about the link between depression and suicide. But you might then expect uh, that these people who are offing themselves, okay, but with very good reasons are not depressed. And uh, so you might find a paradoxical effect, right? That actually it's the people who make less severe attempts are going to have higher levels of depression than people who uh, make more severe attempts. And there is a study showing that. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but... Uh, um, it's, it's, there haven't been many studies looking at that, but, it's, uh, but there, I've seen one, and it's, uh, I, I jumped on that because I thought, oh my god, that's really fascinating. Yes, ma'am. Have you looked at um, people who, who think that they pose a burden to others like, like it, it would make sense that an elderly person, if they feel that they're a burden on their children, yep. might be more or less likely and this could possibly <coughs> That's where I was trying to go. I mean, you're, you're, yes, that's exactly what I wanted to sort of flesh out a little bit further is uh, uh, that, yes, that these are, it's a kin selection sort of argument, right? It's uh, that um, somehow your continued existence is uh, a burden on your children if you're elderly or uh, on your current family if you've got, uh, if you're just chronically old, whatever age, 
or if you're a white male in your 30s and you're single and living with your parents, you know that um, that it's it's a burden on their reproductive success. So you, I mean, that's the that's the theoretical paradigm that, that potentially explains all those findings that I haven't looked at it personally. So yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, Kim. I'm not even sure what the question is, but I'm interested in depression that seems to be inherited and that they call it historical trauma, but it's generation after generation within a population like American Indians have experienced major trauma over a number of generations. And then it's like there's a almost transmission of not only depression but social pathologies. Yeah, you know what? I haven't really thought about that, but you know, it also strikes me that you might look at this in um, the children and offspring of the Jewish survivors of uh, Nazi Germany, right? So, yeah, okay. Um, well, I, I don't know mechanistically what's happening there, but kind of, you could kind of make some sense. Uh huh. Well, I guess the idea might be uh, similar to what you might see, like children who are exposed to trauma end up growing up sort of with a more depressogenic uh, adult profile, right? So the idea I think there is that uh, you're experiencing things in life that set you up to believe that life is going to be difficult or hard and uh, it pays to sort of adopt a sort of depressogenic stance. Um, and you could make a similar argument maybe with some of this intergenerational stuff, huh? Maybe. I think so. Yeah. You develop your own measure of depression because you saw deficiencies in the existing ones. Were you looking for something different? Yes, I was. Uh, so the reason for that is um, I was trying to identify short-term changes in mood. Okay. And I initially started off using like the the mackle and the dackle, the multiple adjective affect adjective checklist and the depression adjective checklist. Um, and I found that it wasn't quite sensitive enough because it's just a checklist. You check in uh, an each adjective. Are you depressed? Are you lonely? Are you, you know, downhearted, etc. cetera. And, um, and that seemed to me not quite sensitive enough. What I really wanted was uh, adjectives and then rate each, ad rate each adjective on a Likert scale. That's what I needed is because then I could look at yeah, maybe they'd still say they were downhearted, uh, but I was looking for changes in downheartedness, right? You know, and uh, so I devised my. So your measure, for example, a typical measure looks at behavior. Yours doesn't look at behavior. Yeah. No. Well, yeah, uh, in part because uh, I'm going to look. I mean, literally, like it's take baseline measure, give them a few practice questions, and then, you know, I mean. Now, in principle, I could begin to look at some behaviors. Like I could have, at the second mood measure, look at, give people some sentences to say, and look at how voice pitch changes, because that's supposed to change. Yeah. Ethogram? What's that? Um, ethogram. Basically, take patients very micro analysis of facial expressions. Okay. And all the physiological measures. Yeah. Okay, a colleague of mine is basically pushing me to do this uh, stuff too. Yeah, uh, another another colleague. Yes, uh, absolutely. And I would like to do that, but my my first stab at this was just a, a check. Uh, yeah, this kind of adjective checklist. Yeah. Disparities of different racial groups. Um, um, I I read or heard uh, somewhere that African Americans tend to be accepted, like blues is more accepted, so they, they don't. Is depression, so uh -huh. they don't get diagnosed or get treated as much. So that will give you two separate groups that you can think a little bit different. That's interesting. Yeah. Right. Asians. Sorry? The Asian the Chinese concept of depression is so different. Yeah. But they, well, they still have the same symptoms, right? They just sort report them differently. Of, yeah, I think there's some. Oh really? 
Like what? I'm curious. I mean, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um. All right, I don't want to get too far off into our third. Well, let's put it this way. I'm from Turkey, and the way I became a warrior, this, the wording is shake it off. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's more semantic, right? It is more semantic. In Japanese, too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're not supposed to have mental problems, so there's a real perception that, uh, you know, that's not. The issues there between the subconscious and self-deception, what kind of, okay. you know, it, it, there are male and female differences there that are two where males don't want to open themselves to showing that they're depressed. Yeah. Because that that's going to have a different effect on their yeah. Um, but the, yeah, the, the Chinese. There's some some flips in the sex ratios and the autogeny of um, um, you know, clinical presentations. So I mean, there's there's some stuff going on there, and how much of it is you know a reflection of what you're socially culturally what's acceptable to be thinking about, and how you're trying to self present yourself. This, but you know, there's some big differences, and those I think can in turn affect how you ruminate. So it's affecting the rumination process. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that uh, the sex ratio change in China may actually sort of switch? I mean, it might. Right? More males than females in China, right? At least for a while there, right? Because of yeah. their uh, well, policies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that would, I mean, that there's a lot more males than can find partners, and that might reverse the whole sex difference in depression, right? Yeah, but there's something else strange about the rural urban and stuff that doesn't quite jive with that. What's the rural urban difference? There's more female rural incidents. There's more male urban. I don't remember. Okay. So, no. the book Anatomy of an Epidemic, have you read that? I cited it here. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Good discussion. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Great. Okay. So you're all convinced. Yeah.